talking about superstition. We're not afraid of Harry Potter or Pokemon cards. We're not afraid of the Wolfman or the vampires. Uh, we're not afraid of any of that. Anything about Frankenstein and all the things, you know, uh, you, if you remember when you were a young child, uh, the first time you ever saw one of those Wolfman movies or something along lo those kind of lines, you were freaked out. I mean, most kids cry the very first times that they see uh, any kind of thing like that. And parents come and say, oh, honey, oh, honey, it's, uh, it's just a movie. Until we have indoctrinated uh, our kids into evil. And yet when the Holy Spirit begins to move, so many people within the churches today will grab their young children and want to head out of the church. Oh my God, it's the Holy Spirit. And we've turned Jesus into the freaky guy and the things of Satan into normal, into normal things. And my friend, there's something wrong with that kind of thing. A lot of people in church completely freak out when they see things like that because they have never seen anything like that. There's nothing abnormal about that, according to Scripture. It's completely normal for things like that to take place within church and with people who walk in the anointing. It's completely normal, and it's part of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has given us to help people who have tried everything else. And, um, and tonight, what I want to talk about is demonically induced torments, afflictions, uh, sicknesses, aches, and pains. And uh, it's a lot more common than, uh, than what you would ever imagine. An unclean spirit can mimic any type of sickness and any type of disease. You know, a lot of times you go to the doctor and what works for somebody, some kind of medication, what works for them just doesn't, they, try, they throw everything in the book at you. And nothing, nothing works for you. No, nothing touches this thing. And that's usually a pretty good indication that there's something uh, spiritual that's going on. I'm not here to talk about can a Christian have a demon tonight. Uh, if you're not quite at that level yet, hang around. We'll hit on some of that stuff. Maybe we'll hit on some of that stuff tonight. Uh, if there's any question in your mind, of course. Of course they can. And uh, there is no scripture at all, contrary to what a lot of people say, to prove anything different. I want you to, re to remind you that the Jews were God's chosen people and he let his chosen people uh, end, up, end up with these things. We've shown plenty of scriptures in the past uh, showing that even people with the Holy Spirit can end up with unclean spirits. And unfortunately our families have been involved in a lot of things they never should have done. The Lord led his people up to the Valley Moab and up to the Jordan River. He said, you see those people over there? They are so cursed, they really almost can't even be repaired. And we're going to go in there, and we're going to take back all that land that used to belong to me till they gave it all away through all their occult involvement, all their demonic stuff. I mean, Abraham was the first guy that went up there and dedicated the land, isn't that right? The whole thing belonged to God. The land of Canaan was God's property. He was just coming to get it back. He said, but the thing is, don't go over there and do what those people do over there. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 16 clearly tells us, don't get involved with uh, any of the Harry Potter stuff, any kind of the witchcraft stuff. If you've been involved with Harry Potter, my friend, you've got a problem right now. If anybody has ever asked you what your birth sign is and you ever said, oh, I'm a Cancer, I'm a Libra, you've got one. He's in there. I'm not making this up. You can, read, you can read the scripture for yourself. Can't involve with any kind of divination. You know, they have little wedding parties with put a little string with a little needle on there. It's going to be a boy, going to be a girl. Yes, no. You know, people get involved in all this kind of stuff, sitting at the beauty parlor waiting to get your hair cut, and you're looking at your horoscope, looking at your astrology thing, and you think, well, I'm not really involved in this. It's really just kind of a joke, and it's just kind of a, a fun thing. My friend, Satan's not a joke. Demons aren't, demons aren't a joke. It's not a jokey thing. It's not any kind of fun thing. You stray into Satan's territory, you got it. You got it. And that's just a fact of life. And that's just the way that it goes. You might think that's a lie, but don't go home early tonight. We'll find out if we got any trouble right here in River City. We'll find out. And just uh, open your heart to the Lord, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you just straight out. 
If you come in here with an attitude of, eh, see, it's not about the anointing. We, we can, you know, we can have 100,000, whoever you think is the anointed one, Benny Hinn or whoever, whatever. I mean, people are Jesus meetings and they never got touched because they had hardened their heart. They had set their minds. They had made their forehead hard as flint. My friend, open up the Bible. Open up your mind. Humble yourself as little children and the Lord can really come in and do something with your life. One touch from this God can bring healing, can bring the gifts, can open up your ears to hear the voice of God. You can receive the power within your life. But only the truth. That's right. Only the truth is going to be able to help you get free. Let's go over to uh, Job 33, verse 14. For God speaks once, yes, he'll even speak twice, yet man cannot perceive it. And you ask how many people there are in the body of Christ today. Do you hear the voice of God? And they go, well, uh, I don't know. And I've been in every kind of church that there is. I've been in every country of the world. And it's always the same. About 80% of the people go, well, I, I don't know. I think maybe I heard something one time or a couple times, but I don't know. And I'm not sure if it's the enemy or... God speaks, but we cannot perceive it. Yet the Bible says, call unto me, I will answer. I'll show you great things that you don't even know about. People calling out to, the, out, out to God in their prayer closets. Oh, God, give me a gift. Give me, give me a gift. God is never going to answer that prayer for you. You forget all about that. That is a pointless, ridiculous prayer. You already have the same Holy Spirit in you that raised Jesus from the dead. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit gives gifts severally as needed. And we're calling out for something believing we don't have it, which is lack of faith and unbelief and lack of knowledge. We've strayed from the Word of God. But my friend... Even when you know that, you're not going to get it unless you need it. It says, the Holy Spirit gives gifts severally as needed. And you're calling out to God, oh, give me a gift. And God's going, what for? And you're going, because I want to serve you. And God's going, no, it, no, if you wanted to serve me, you'd be serving me right now. And then you would need it. But because you're not doing it, you don't need it. Right. And that's a hard thing. But that's just God's honest truth right there. You go out there and signs, wonders, and miracles follow you. They don't precede you. They follow you and they follow your faith. But you got to step out. You got to get past the enemies saying, ah, just go to church and everything be cool. No, going to church is nothing. There's nothing about going to church that impresses God. There's nothing about going to church that makes you holy. If going to church made you holy, then every demon would be holy by now. <laughs> the churches are full of demons, completely full of demons. Amen. The Bible says as men slept, the enemy sowed tares amongst the wheat. And we're making all our excuses. We got our doctors, we got our psychologists, we have our immunization, we have our social programs and our attorneys, and we've got everything. Pharmacies on every corner, still got the Nehushtan, the serpent on the pole that we were commanded to take down by God, spirit of pharmacos rooted in sorcery, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when sleep falls upon men in slumberings upon their bed. Then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. Because the church is full of stiff-necked, prideful ones. They don't care what Jesus said. Most, most, of the, most of the pastors out there today go, well, we believe in Jesus. We just don't quite believe everything he says. Because if they believed what he said, they'd be doing what he said to do. They'd be doing the Great Commission to God. But they've got every ex excuse in the world. My friend, if it's a pastor who's getting, let's say he gets 100,000 people saved a year. Uh, that's a pretty good amount. And that's way the heck past somebody like me. All of us. And that's what he does. And he doesn't go past that. It's false. That's false Christianity. You might go, no, that's not false Christianity. I mean, come on, he's getting 100,000 people saved. It's not the gospel. Let me ask you something, my friend. If you went down and you ordered a big old family-sized pizza pie, and that guy came to your door, and he brought you one piece of pizza, and then he tried to charge you $35 for the full pizza, are you going to pay it? No. Are you going to buy into that? You gonna buy into that? You go down to the dentist and you got a toothache, and they go, "What do you want?" You go, "I, I want to get my tooth fixed," and they go, well, "We don't believe in that." And then on the way out, 
The nurse at the front desk goes, that'll be $75 for the office visit. Leave it right there in the hat. Are you going to buy into that? Are you going to pay into that? Galatians 1, 6 through 10 says, if I, or an angel of God, or anyone, ever comes and changes this gospel that Jesus Christ brought by example, let them receive a curse. And yet today they go, ah, oh, Christian can't. Christian can't have a curse, don't you know? Galatians 3.13, Jesus went upon the cross and he took the curses of the whole world upon himself and now there's no more curses. Is that right? That's not what it says. It don't say that at all. They say it says that. It says he broke us from the curse of the law. No, I agree with that. But you know what? You know what the funny thing is? When you start looking at so much of the law, like the Ten Commandments, and you start coming over here to the New Testament, it's still all the stuff there. It's still penalty. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Galatians 5, the 17 wor works of the flesh. All of them says, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet we're, we're doing all that stuff. <coughs> we're involved in all those kinds of things. Hmm. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. Now look at this, 19. He is chastened also with pain upon his bed. One of the corrective measures that God uses with his people is pain. Pain is handled by unclean spirits. It's handled by curses. And I'm going to prove this to you, prove this to you scripturally. And with the multitude of his bones with strong pain. You can have bone diseases. The Bible says envy, jealousy is as rottenness to the bones. The wounds of a talebearer go down in the stomach. If you're a gossiping person, you're going to have stomach problem. The root of bitterness. Many people become defiled. You can end up with all of these acid problems where you're taking all these antacid things all the time. Still saying, oh, glory to God, and I believe everything about Jesus. Well, believing in Jesus is not enough. Having Jesus in your life is not enough. That's not enough. You also got to believe the Word of God. You also have to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to believe that when God says something in the Bible, man, that that's, tr that that's true. This is not hell and brimstone preaching I'm talking about here right now. This is just normal, straight-out talk of how to be able to come in and solve our problems. There are... There are people within the church today, one out of five of them is on antidepressive medication right now. That's just the God's honest truth. That's a fact. 80% of the pastors right now, 80% of the pastors within the first three to five years of their ministry will completely give up, quit, and walk away. And 20% of that is ready to quit right now out of what's even left over. Why? Because demons are real. And that's what they do. They come and they see to it that you just get so frustrated and you give up from these attacks that you just walk away from your ministry. And if you don't know the word of God, who gets blamed? These pastors out here are telling you a Christian cannot have a demon and you can't have a curse and you can't be attacked, anything like that. And then we get attacked, who are you going to blame? Then God becomes the good guy and God becomes the bad guy and everybody starts to get confused. But the Bible says the Lord is not the author of confusion. And where you find confusion, you're going to find every evil work. The church gets all freaky when you start talking about demons and start talking about deliverance and start talking about curses. They're full of fear. They're full of anxiety. They're full of dread and pressure and stress and apprehension. The Bible calls that an unclean spirit, spirit of heaviness and depression. Isaiah 61 verse 3, that's a spiritual problem. All the fears, all the dreads, all the anxieties. It's an unclean spirit. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. And yet we deny that because we don't know the word. And we want to go to the doctor. And we want to get something to settle us down. And to calm us down. And we've just strayed further and further and further away from the gospel. Until someone comes along and starts preaching the real gospel. They are religious fanatics. Crazy religious fanatics. The Bible says that in the last days, people shall heap to themselves teachers, having itchy ears and wanting to hear what they want to hear until they turn the gospel of Jesus Christ into a fairy tale. And today, Jesus is just a little Tinkerbell fairy in most of the church, sprinkling love dust over the congregation while the pastors tell you, just rest in the love of God. My friend, if you just rest in the love of God, 
you're going to die like everybody else. You're going to die early. You're not going to get out of that wheelchair. That asthma's not going to go away. Them headaches are never going to stop. Those problems are never going to go away. Why? Isn't the love of Jesus good? Of course it's good. There is a Lamb of God. Of course. But there's also a line of Judah. And they don't want the line of Judah in the church today. Line of Judah comes in the church. The usher's going to get him up and get that person out. Today, today we don't cast demons out of the church. We cast people out of the church. And it's time for that to change. Verse 20. So that his life abhors bread and his soul dainty meat. You can get to the place where you start having eating, eating disorders. Either you're overeating because of the pressure and stress. You know, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 28, even if 10 women come and bake you bread every single day, yet you won't be satisfied. And you know how many people that, that there are that have these kind of eating disorders. You go, my God, why am I eating this thing? I'm not even hungry. No matter how much you eat, it just, nothing satisfies. And other people, they, they don't eat at all. They go into anorexia. They go into binging and purging. They go into bulimia. All of these things are unclean spirits that have been allowed to get into our family line through and by going against the things of God. His flesh is consumed away. There's all the sicknesses and all the diseases that it cannot be seen. And his bones that you didn't used to be able to see now stick out. Yes, his soul draws near to the grave and his life to the destroyers. Who's the destroyer? Jesus said, cast off the yoke of Satan and take upon yourself his burden, which is, which is light and easy. He's talking about Deuteronomy 28, verse 48. You will serve your enemies in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, in want of all things until you'll be utterly destroyed. The destroyer is listed in the Bible as a demonic spirit. Remember, he went around and killed all the firstborn. That's what his job does. And we can allow the destroyer into our life. In the book of Hebrews says, neither murmur you as they murmured, neither complain as they complain. For this was an example unto us that we can be attacked by serpents, it says serpents, and, by, and destroyed by the destroyer. And Paul is preaching to his own church. We can have serpents against us and we can have destroyers against us according to the word of God. And this is why we need to talk about these kind of things in the church. Satan has been allowed to hide in the shadows of our ministries, of our church, of our marriages, of our family for too long. And we don't realize the consequence of some of the things that we can even bring into our own house that can bring us trouble. Any of these video games that have any kind of demonic images upon it, you're going to have demons coming in your house. It's an open doorway into your house. Any of these Pokemons, any of these Harry Potter books, you might go, well, I don't know about Harry Potter. It's just a movie. Come on, James. This is like so religious. I don't get involved in witchcraft. I just look at it. Well, let me ask you this. What if we said, well, I don't pose in pornography. I just look at it. How would that be? Jesus said, be careful what you set your eyes upon for the eyes are the window to the soul. Be careful what you hear, Jesus said. There are gates on the body. You can allow these demonic things in. The Bible says, in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no idols before me, before you. You bring idols in, these things in your house, the Bible says you will become a curse object like that, thing that's already cursed. The devil can't come in your house and let you invite him in, but there's many ways you can invite the devil into your house. And then pretty soon, your whole house is out of whack. Everybody's fighting. Wife won't listen to the husband anymore. Priesthood of the home has been completely destroyed. The husband's a fool, so why should we listen to that? The kids are in anarchy. Anarchy raised in the home is anarchy released in the streets. Train up a child in the way he will go. What are the children seeing going on in the family? That's why we need to get delivered ourselves. This is a commandment by God. This is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man his uprightness. Then he is gracious unto him and says, Deliver him! Oh. From going down to the pit, I have found a ransom. This is talking about Jesus. Look at verse 30, 27. He looks upon men, and if any say, I have sinned, and I have perverted that which was right, 
and it did not profit me. What are they doing right here? They're doing 1 John 1 and 9. They're doing renunciation right here. Breaking these curses. Then he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things works God often with men. Correction. To bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. A lot of people say, well, yeah, but you know, you're, you're preaching a bunch of Old, Old Testament uh, kind of stuff here, James. Go over to, um, let's go over to the Old Testament. I want to show you something here. Let's go over to uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28. Now, most people would say, well, oh, we're, going in the, we're going into the law here. But let's see if this is the law. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. It shall come to pass, if you will hearken diligently to the voice of your God, to observe and do all his commandments. His commandments. So it's not just about the law. See, not everything, not everything was about the law. There's plenty of things that are still here. Blessed are those who keep the commandments of God. That's Revelations 22, verses 14, my friend. If you want to enter into the kingdom of God, it says you must keep the Ten Commandments. Look at this. Verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if you will not hearken on the voice of the Lord God, to observe and do all his commandments that I command you this day, then all of these curses can come upon you and overtake you. All of these curses, all of these things. You know, I highlight my Bible with a green anytime it's demonic or a curse. That's how many there are. You see how much green there is? That's how much trouble you can get from breaking the Ten Commandments. I'm not making this up. We just read the Word of God. It's all. It's all here, even right now. Look at verse 20. The Lord shall send upon you, the Lord, yeah, it's Satan that's doing this, but Satan can't come against you unless the Lord okays it. Yeah. And he will okay it. That's why we do have problems. But why will God okay it? Because we okayed it first. Right. We okayed it first. The Lord shall send upon you cursing, vexation, rebuke in all you set your hand to do until you be destroyed. There's the destroyer again. Until you perish quickly. Because the wickedness of your doings whereby you have forsaken me. People say, well, that's not Jesus. Well, Jesus said, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Jesus comes to judge and make war. That's the real Jesus. Nobody wants to preach that, but that's, but that's the real Jesus. Does that mean Jesus doesn't love us? Of course he loves us. You get a demon because, the, because God loves you. Why? Because he doesn't want you to perish. He wants to get you back on track. He's trying to shake us up and wake us up because of our stubborn, rebellious pride that we wouldn't turn and change ourselves voluntarily. Look at 22. The Lord shall smite you with consumption, there's cancer, with fevers, with inflammation, with extreme burnings, there's fevers, with the sword, with blasting, with mildew. They shall pursue you until you, until you perish. Verse 27, the Lord shall smite you with the botch of Egypt and with emeralds, those are tumors, tumor cysts and boils, with scabs, with itchy things, whereby you cannot be healed. Now, you can go to all the doctors in the world. There's plenty of things. You know, if you really know doctors, my son's a doctor. He graduated Harvard University. I mean, you know, they all think they're hot shots and they know every kind of thing in the world. But when you really get, but when you really get down to it and you really start asking these doctors, Okay, so uh, what's the dynamics of this? They go, we really don't know. But we do know that sometimes this medication will work for this. Sometimes it don't. Why? We really don't know. I mean, if you can get them down to that point, they, they really don't know. It's an imprecise science. Verse 28, the Lord shall smite you with madness. People going crazy. People with mental illness with blindness and astonishment of heart. Astonishment of heart is, is heart attack problems. You can be spiritually blind. You can be physically blind. Look at verse 33. The fruit of your land and all your labors shall a nation which you know not shall eat up. 
You will only be oppressed and crushed always. Now there's the poverty and lack curses that come in upon people's lives. You know, the church today will tell you, oh, just uh, put some more money in the pastor's hat. Come on, we're passing around the thing and put some money in there and God will open up the storehouses of heaven and blah, blah, blah. We heard that like so many times. Pour out a blessing too great to receive, la, 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 la. Everybody has heard that a million times, that whole manipulating thing. And you might go, manipulating that scripture. Well, manipulation is not including the fullness of the scripture. And if you go on before that, it says, for you're cursed with a curse. See, they've forgotten that you're cursed with a curse. And if you're cursed with a curse, it means an unclean spirit is there. And you can't buy your way with money out of a curse. You can come back and get in line. I mean, you have to be a tither and all that kind of stuff. I mean, anybody with common sense that knows a word knows all about that. But you're not going to buy your way out of trouble by doing anything like that, you're going to have to go back and do deliverance over those areas of poverty and lack and cast those things out that have come in. If there's a curse there, it's done spiritually. There's no other way to do it. Even the people out on the street you, who say, well, we don't believe in curses, but we believe in good luck and bad luck. And you go, well, what's that? And they go, well, see? But, it, but inevitably, it's going to boil down to something unexplained Spiritual affects something either for positive or negative that normally would not have affected it by some chain of events that somebody did cause an effect. And it's just talking about spiritual principles that God told us about. Look at verse 35. The Lord shall smite you in your knees, in your legs, and with sore botches that cannot be healed. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head. See, the Lord's got it all covered that you can't just run off to the doctor. He's got it already worked out to make sure that you're not just gonna you're not gonna just fall into that. You remember with Esau. Esau it says, and then Esau became diseased in his feet, and he sought after physicians and not after the Lord, and he died in his sickness. He died in his in his diseases. My friend, all of this stuff is real. If you went over to the, uh, the other grandfather curses, or it would be in uh, Leviticus 26, I mean, we could go on forever. You should go and read Deuteronomy 28. You know, uh, in any prayer line, if you brought people up in a prayer line and we started asking you, so uh, what's going on in your life? What do you want prayer for? Whatever you said, I could, I could, I could find you that curse in 10 seconds. Just by knowing Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Everything spins out of there, the whole rest of the Bible, until the book of Revelations. If you acquaint yourself with this, you will be able to go very far in deliverance. And in the healing ministry, they're actually, actually one, one and the same. Leviticus 26. Look at verse 3. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. You see? It's not just the law. It's not just talking about some kind of thing like that. What is it about? It's about the occult. Look at 26 verse 1. You'll have no idols, no graven images, no standing images, no images of stone, no kind of demonic stuff in your house. It's all about the occult. People think it's some non-understandable kind of thing. Look at verse 14. But if you will hearken unto me and will not do my commandments... If you despise and you hate my commandments and break them, then I will appoint over you terror, consumption, burnings, eye problems, depression, money trouble. Your enemies will take away that which you work so hard and long for. And I will break the pride of your power, verse 19. Your strength will be spent in vain. You'll work and you'll work and you'll get nothing because your enemies will just keep taking it away. Satan tells you, no, I just got to get two jobs. <laughs> then you got to get three jobs. Then your wife got to get two jobs. Then your wife got to get three jobs. And even the kids got to get a job because it just makes sense. If you work more and you work harder and you work longer, you're going to make more to make up for everything that you're being robbed of. But the odd thing is, is that the, the more that you work, the more things break down. The more things get lost. Because you can't work your way out of a physical curse, or out of a spiritual curse by doing something physical. 
That's a worldly thinking. That kind of thought come, comes from the devil. You go in and you start breaking your curses, those poverty land curses are going to go away. Why? Well, the Bible says he'll supply your needs according to his riches and glory. But if you went to the Lord right now and you go, well, I need, God to go, well, what do you need? You go, well, I need money because I've got to pay my, my bills and my car payment's coming up, my rent's coming up, and God's going to go, well, what, what do you need a car for? What do you need a house for? That's what he's going to ask you. What do you need that for? You're going to go, to live. He's going to go, for what? For what? He says in the book of Revelations, I know you. You're the church that says you're alive, but you're dead. What do you need it for? What do you need a car for? You go, to go to work. You go, really? Where, where do you work? You go, oh, I work down at Walmart. He goes, seek first the kingdom of God. And then all things will be added on to you. You have to have a need. And your need has to be primary of searching the Lord, serving Him first. And if you're not serving Him first in some kind of way, if you're walking into Walmart and the Lord goes, why don't you ask that person if they need prayer? And you go, oh, I didn't hear anything. Why don't you ask that person if they know the Lord? Oh, they'll think I'm in Jesus' free. Then you don't need. You don't need anything. You know, the Bible does guarantee that you'll have some clothes and food. You don't see Christians walking around with no food and naked. That's the only thing God guarantees you, regardless of everybody's going to be a millionaire teacher down there. That's not the way that, it's go that it goes, my friend. God doesn't owe you anything. You are here to serve Jesus. You are here to serve the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you'll do that, then you have needs. You go... Well, we can't all be like you. That's right. Can't all be this kind of thing. I didn't volunteer for this job either. But my friend, you have to be doing something for God. That's why we are here. The Bible says he knew you before the foundations of the world. But today they go, no, that's just a religious thing. And I don't want to be this. And I don't want to be that. And I'm here because... No, you're not. He is the father of lights. He put your spirit in your mother intentionally that you would come here and serve him. Does that mean you have to serve him? No, most people don't. Most people don't. But that's not God's fault. It's not God's fault that we're not excited about God. You know why we're not excited about God? Because we go to, these, because we go to church and nothing happens. You feel a little warm, fuzzy feeling during praise and worship, and then nothing happens. Where's the things that's going on? I mean, if things aren't going on, then Jesus isn't there. Why would you want to? Why would you want to go somewhere where Jesus isn't there? And I'm not saying we're the golden boy of religion here. We're far from that. But this is truth. This is truth. And where's your life at? Where's your life at? Most people just bored as all heck with the things of God. None of the kids can sit still. Put them in front of a Harry Potter movie. They'll sit still. Put them in front of Star Wars. They'll. They'll sit there. They'll be interested as all heck. Train them up the way they will go. Train them up. That's why we have Sunday schools, because we don't raise our kids correctly. There's no such thing as a Sunday school. There's no scripture for that. There's not one single scripture. And yet if you said that, if you said that to the church, they'd go, Ah, oh, well, that's ridiculous. The kids would destroy the whole, the whole meeting running around. Well, train up the kids in the way they'll go. That's up to the parents. There's something wrong if a kid can't sit still for an, for an hour. They can sit still and watch a movie. They can sit still and listen to God. If they're not that interested in God, there's got to be something wrong. There's got to be some demon in there. There has to be. People always bringing their kids into me. Oh, James, please. My son, my daughter, they're so rebellious. Please help them get free. I said, the kids are rebellious? He goes, yeah. I go, well, you're God's kids. Let's start with you. Because that's where it came from. And they'll go, how dare you say that's where it came from? I'm a good person. I go to church. That's what they'll say. They'll say all kinds of things like that. But my friend, you have to see what's rebellion according to God's eyes. According to God, the priest of the home should have delivered his kids, a boy by the time he's 13, a girl by the time she's 12. Should have delivered them completely. Not just talk about it. There's a lot of churches go, well, we believe in deliverance too, but they don't do it. A lot of people go, well, we believe completely in deliverance, but they don't do it. And you go, well, I didn't know about it. Well, because your father was a rebel, and your grandfather was a rebel, and your great-grandfather was a rebel, and there was rebels for the last 20, 
2,000 years in our family, mine included. Mine included. I grew up on the street. I was not a little angel boy. You never would have got me in a church until I was about 30 years old. You can forget about that. Punch you in the face. That's the kind of kid that I was. I didn't have no parents. I grew up on the beach. Till I saw the real power of God. Till I saw the real thing. Then when I saw the power of God, now that got my interest. But before that, people used to come up to me and go, You need Jesus. And I go, What? Need Jesus? For what? They go, Because you, boy, with some problems. I go, Well, then show me. I'm from Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> well, they couldn't show me anything. They'd talk big. Jesus could solve all this. They never did anything for me. And finally, when I got to be around 30, I was a smart mouth boy. And uh, finally, somebody said, you need Jesus. I went, oh, here we go. I go, what do I want that for? They go, well, do you have any problems? I went, yeah. Well, what do you got? Oh, I got some allergies, and I hurt my back a couple weeks ago. My back was really hurting that day. And I hurt my back. I got some back pain. I'm going like, ah, well, let's see. He goes, oh, you want to see? I go, yeah, like that. I mean, just a smart little mouth boy, you know? That's the way I was. That's the way I grew up. And he goes, okay, well, why don't you just say to Jesus, uh, Jesus, uh, if me or my family ever said or did anything that could have brought in that back trouble and them allergies, I ask forgiveness, and I went, oh, what the heck. Okay. I said it. I mean, this guy, he got nothing. He just, he don't even look like a preacher. He's just wearing some old T-shirt. Some old Levi's hole in the knee. I'm like, this guy's joker. <coughs> you know, because you think you're looking, you know. <coughs> and he just went, lose! <laughs> lose him! Like that. And I went, wow! I went down to the ground. Whoa. I mean, I went down. I went, nobody could do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's God's honest truth. That's God's honest truth. And when I stood up, my back was healed. Didn't have no allergies anymore. I go, what's in that thing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he said, you got to go on down there. I went down to the first deliverance meeting I ever went into. I, I walked in the church door. I was like, Mr. Macho, you know, coming in. I was going to go in there and show that preacher something. And the minute I walked in the door, I was like, oh, like this. Oh, I started feeling my heart was start going do, 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 like this. I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? Drank too much coffee. <laughs> 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 I heard a voice in my head I heard a voice in my head say these people are evil like that literally I heard it clear as light these people are evil they're doing some kind of witchcraft here you know just straight out of the scripture just like that I tried to make it to the last row I couldn't even make it. I ran out to church <laughs> sit out there having a cigarette trying to calm myself <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> and, and I sat there, and then finally I started to calm down. I went, "Yeah, that'd be a took, maybe I took two vitamins today, or I, uh, I'm trying to like write some hormonal thing, or you know." I go, "Okay," and then all, I could hear the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what that was, but you know, there's this other voice going, "You know why you're here. You need to go back in." And I went. I came back to that door, man, and I made it just about to the last, no, the three rows. I made it three rows this time. <laughs> oh, I felt this thing come on me again like this, and I'm like going over like this to the chair, you know, like, like this. That's freaky stuff. This is real stuff. It's, real, it's a real war, my friend. You see people get up and run out here all the time. It's a real war. And uh, I, I sat down in that chair, and I'm just like, down like this, trying to hide like. Pastor's wife goes, young man. <laughs> 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 young man. Like, 
okay, huh? And I turn around. <laughs> I turn around looking because I'm thinking, it's just some old people back there. <laughs> Come up here. <laughs> Come on up here. I'm like, you know those hard hat scuba divers? You know the hard hats in the Navy? They got those big lead shoe, boots like, like, <laughs> like that. <laughs> That was the longest walk I ever took. <laughs> That's part of my testimony. But, uh, you know, when I got up there, man, and they started doing that Jesus deliverance thing on me, I'll tell you, you know what happened? It just like, this thing lifted off of me, and I saw for the first time in my adult life. You know, you get to be an adult and after a while you go, ah, oh, it's just part of life and it's just part of the pressure and it's just the way it is and you just, uh, and you just accept it because you're looking around and just about everybody's got it. But let me tell you, man, when that thing pulled off, I felt like I was like 15 years old again. You know, when you, I mean, not the 15 year old, years old today, they already got the pressure and stress, but back then, you know, it was simple. It was a simple life. And, uh, man, it was just like a million pounds got lifted, off, got lifted off of me. It began to change my whole entire life. And one by one by one, I started getting healed and delivered from all this kind of stuff. I mean, I used to be, if I picked up a cat, I'd be sneezing for four hours. If I went for a walk out in the woods, you know, when the pollen's going, I just like watery eyes and all this you know, kind of stuff, wool, feathers. I mean, I was just allergic to all this kind of stuff. It was all demonic. All of it. Of course it is. If you stop and you think about it, God created the cats and the wolves and the flowers, and he created us. And the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. God cannot be in opposition to himself. But if we buy into this whole demonic explanation, I mean, whatever it is that you have wrong with you, if I asked you, well, why do you think you have it? You'd give me a logical explanation that somebody who didn't know what they were talking about, maybe even a demon, had to explain it to you, maybe even in your own mind. And it seems completely rational until you come back to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And once you understand the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and you, you do what you say, uh, I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. You know, we all like to sing that at church. I traded my sickness. I traded my pain. I laid it down. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. Until we're just singing a bunch of stuff, singing a bunch of victory songs that we don't even have. We become professional liars in the church of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says God is truth. Worship him in spirit and truth. But we don't worship him in spirit and truth because we claim false testimony rather than real testimony. And the reason why we don't have the real testimony is we don't know the real gospel of Jesus Christ. And we mock it. We won't believe even the thing that we say that we are. I mean, if you can't believe in your own God, it's time to get another God. Psalms 55, verse 1, whatever that's worth, 55 verse 1, give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my prayer, supplication, attend unto me and hear me, I mourn in my complaint, and I make noise, because of the voice of the enemy, the voice of the enemy. Because of the oppression of the wicked, wickedness is Satan. For they cast iniquity, excuse making, upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is sore pained within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. I mean, sadness, depression, groaning, enemies, accusers, wicked oppression, your, your iniquities against you, terror, fear, dread, horror, feeling overwhelmed. All of these are demonic things. 
Every single one of them. I mean, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And you have Jesus. If I'm in Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus is in me. If you have Jesus in you, then where's your rest? Then where's your peace? Where's that? You know, this is just a reality check here. You know, we, 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 we live in such pretense. Why? Well, because the church expects that of us. The church today is for pretty people and pretty things and beautiful things. But that's not what the church was created for. The church was meant for people who have problems. Even if you looked in Webster's dictionaries, and Web Webster is a secular book, it says the job of a pastor is to deal in the spirituality issues of its congregation. I mean, even they, de even they declare that. We've already got all the other things. The church is not a, a social program. The church is not a concert. Although music is good, worship is good, of course it is. But where's the power? Where's the moving of the Holy Spirit? Where's the signs and the wonders and the miracles? And how did we ever come to the place of accepting not having that? How did we ever come to that and believe that that's normal when we can't even find it in our own book? Hmm. Look at Luke 13, verse 11. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years and was bowed together and could no wise lift up herself. Now, where's she at? She's in church. See, but people get used to seeing sick people in church. People get used to hearing complainers in church. People get used to it. Or you don't know it because you go to some big old giant church with... 10,000 people, which is nice and safe, because you can disappear into the crowd and nobody really notices you. And everybody comes in and plays the dress-up thing and the look-pretty thing and declare that they're doing some great thing for God. But all you're doing is escaping, and you're hiding. Escaping from what? Well, answer yourself. What's going on during the week? What's going on during the week? Answer yourself. Are you living a victorious life? Are you walking in freedom? Are you healed by the stripes of Jesus like you say? Is Satan under your feet or is he also in your lungs? Also in your head? Also in your skin? Who's fooling who? Who's fooling who? That's the thing that we need to deal with. Answer that question. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, be loosed. That's deliverance right there. That's deliverance. Be loosed from your infirmities. And he laid his hands on her, lay hands upon the sick, they recover, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the people in the church got angry. Same reason why they get angry today. You go in and do healing and deliverance in a church, they get angry. The same demons are still there. They're all still there. Look at verse 16. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, that means that she meets the requirement. She is a believer. She knows the word. She goes to church. She loves the Lord, like so many people in the church today. But they're still completely bound. Still completely bound. When Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus, he was laying in there dead, laying in there in the darkness. Jesus came. He said, come out. He came out into the light. This is getting saved. Came out of the darkness, out of death, into being saved. But she was still, he was still completely bound. Completely bound. And who loosed him? Not Jesus. It's not the job of Jesus to loose you. It's our job. Matthew 16 and 19. Matthew 18 and 18. That which you bind on earth, that which you loose in heaven. That's right. Us. He said, loose him to the church. It's the church's job, but the church doesn't want to do that job. Church has a program. It has to pay its bills. Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, who loved the Lord, 
and went to church. Whom Satan has bound for 18 years, shouldn't she be loosed on church day? And the church went, no. Just like they say today. Just exactly what they say today. Same thing. Matthew 12. Verse 22. Then was brought unto Jesus one possessed with a demon, blind and dumb. Now you see that? There are demons in there, but look what they're doing. With both of these cases here, they're, they're bringing sicknesses and diseases upon people. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. He had a demon and he healed the man. So how do you think that was done? You have to do it through deliverance. Deliverance is a healing miracle ministry. Mark 9, 38. Jesus' guys came up to Jesus. He said, Master, we were down in town this morning and we saw somebody casting out demons in your name. And we told them, you better not do that anymore because you're not one of us. And Jesus said, never stop anyone who does miracles in my name. For those who are for us are not against us. And yet the church is completely against people who do deliverance today. They call it that demon church. That demon. Th See, they try and put a stigma on it when it's just a normal thing. Casting out demons doesn't make it a demon church. It makes it a full gospel of Jesus Christ church is what it what it makes a biblical church. And the people were amazed. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, nah, this guy casts out demons by Beelzebub. That's what they'll say. Why? Because they're full of devils. And the devils are giving glory onto Beelzebub. They can't deny that a miracle happened. Everybody knows a miracle happened. If you said to somebody with a demon, ah, oh, no miracle happened, they'd go, are you crazy? The guy couldn't speak. And he couldn't see. Now he can speak and see. See, a demon wouldn't even say that. He has to acknowledge there was a miracle, but that the miracle didn't come from God. It came from his God, which is Satan. They're always giving the glory on, glory on to Satan. And at the same time, trying to discredit the deliverance people as they do, as they do today. Look at Mark 9, verse 17. Father, we lift you up. We lift you up on high, Father. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto you my son, which has a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he takes him, he tears him. Epilepsy. He foams, gnashes with his teeth, and he wastes away. He pines away. My friend. Today they would just go, oh, he's, epi he's epileptic. And they brought him onto, onto Jesus. When he saw him, straight away the spirit tear him and fell on the ground and wallowed and foamed. Now, the boy is over here like this. Like that. And Jesus and the father are over there speaking. There's nothing going on. There's nothing going on with this boy at all. The boy is just sitting there and does like this. But then they start talking about the problem. And now the demon in that boy is going like this. Like that. And they're looking and they're listening. Demons have very good ears. You saw from them videos, I don't have to yell at no demon. I walk around and whisper. They know what's going on. Now, he's watching like this. Now, he's just trying to be cool. But the minute that Jesus says, okay, like that, what happens? Up he comes. Same thing with Legion. Mark 5, Luke 8. says, the man runs to Jesus and calls out to God for help. And the very next minute, there another voice comes up and says, what do we have to do with you, Jesus? Son of the Most High. See? The demon comes up to protect the house. And this is what we see is going on right here. They brought him, on, him onto him. And when he saw him. See that? When he saw him. When he saw the anointing, if you carry the anointing, my friend, people aren't going to like you. People look at you and they go, ah, I don't know, there's just something about that guy. I just don't, I don't know. It's just, he's so proud. He's so, talk so loud. He 
preaches like this, and he says, Dad. And yet all the anointed people are doing is just trying to help. Just trying to pray. If you met, if you met Jesus, you wouldn't like him. If you weren't delivered, you wouldn't like him. Don't fool yourself. You wouldn't like him at all. He'd be pointing out your stuff. Where's your husband? Oh, I'm living with the guy. Yeah, I know. I mean, he always comes and just puts his finger right on your stuff. Well, if you want to do it right, go home and sell all your stuff. Mr. Covetousness. See, he wouldn't say that to everybody. But he's saying, oh, this man who has the problem. He always puts his finger right on your stuff. And we don't like that. We change churches more than we change our socks today. Because we're... We're ruled by the spirit of offense because we are undelivered. And you come across anointed people, you just ain't going to like that. You're not going to feel comfortable. You're going to be like, ah, oh, what did I come here for? What time is it anyway? <laughs> and what would you be doing if you went home anyway? Just go home, turn on the TV. You think, I mean, if you can ever stop yourself and go, my God, what's going on here? The Bible says take every thought into captivity, forcing it in obedience of Christ Jesus. You've got to check out your thoughts, man. You're going to ask yourself, why, why is it I don't like that guy? He seemed like a nice guy when we went to the restaurant. <laughs> That's a God's honest truth. But you go out in the world, man, even people don't like you. They don't even know why. But those demons come up, they go, oh, you Christians. They go, I never said I was Christian. I've had that many times. They know exactly. They can take a look at the angels who are walking around with you, protecting you, because you're a target if you're doing this kind of ministry. They know what's going on. They don't know exactly what's going on, but they can see you're something to worry about. And that's what we want. We want the enemy worried about us. And when he saw him, then straightway the spirit came up and began to tear at him, and he fell on the ground wallowing and foaming. And Jesus turned to him and said, How long has this been going on? He said, Since he was a baby. Now how would the Lord answer that? Today, the Lord would say to you, well, how many times did you try and deliver your boy? You got your kids ready to go on antidepressant medication. You got your kids talking about wanting to go to the doctor and wanting to go to the hospital. And you go in the teachers who don't know anything, who worship Halloween and aren't allowed to even have a Bible, are telling you your kid has ADHD, ADD. They all got all these three things because the easiest thing for a teacher who's so pressured and stressed and full of demons uh -huh. is to medicate your kids yeah. right. by the spirit of sorcery to keep them so they're yeah. Yeah. sitting there like little zombies. Yeah. My friend, there was none of these three-letter words back when I was a kid. This is all new stuff. Childhood asthma is up 80% in the last 10 years, and yet our air quality and our water quality and even the chemicals that we're being exposed to has gone way, way down. Yep. Nobody can explain it. Oh, yes, they can. There are some who can explain such kind of things. But the father, what could he say? Jesus is going to ask every father here, what did you do with your children when they were growing up? How did you help your kids get free? Did you say, oh, we believe in the power of God, but you never did it? Did you say you believe in deliverance, but you never did it? There are curses coming down the family line. The Bible says, I will visit the sins and iniquities of the fathers, mothers too, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. People go, well, I don't hate God. Sin is hating God. And our family has been involved in all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff, my friend. We got all kinds of stuff. Hmm. And oft times it has cast him into the fire, suicidal, and was and into the waters to destroy him. Destroy, destroy your, you see it? It's right there. It's right there. But if you can do anything, Jesus, have compassion on us. Deliverance is a compassionate ministry. It's forceful. It's loud. It's attacking. It's pushing buttons and pulling strings. It's swatting at the hornet's nest until them hornets finally come out. And then we see what's in there. That's what we do. That's our job. We provoke till we finally get it up and show you the very thing that you've denied all those years was there. Verse 25, when Jesus saw that the people were all come running to see the show, he rebuked the demon saying, you dumb and deaf spirit, I command you come out.